previously on Bible study. So we obviously looked at um, Galatians and Acts wise we were on 16. So we had um, Paul and Silas met Timothy in Derb and then Paul, remember he wasn't allowed to go. We had this little green spike time when the spirit told him to not go up into, into Northern Turkey. And then um, he had the vision of the Macedonian. And that's obviously like the country still called that today, Northern Macedonia, uh, which is up here. A lot of this is more is more Greece now. Um, yeah, this is Macedonia. So, so Paul's coming along. He meets um, Lydia in Neapolis, which you can see is there. It's on the coast of modern day Greece. And then he's gone along to Philippi, which is obviously a letter to the Philippians, which we'll get to soon. You can see there, Philippi. And then he got imprisoned in Philippi. And that's where they, we had the story um, where Paul and Cyrus are in prison and they're praying and the earthquake happens and the angel comes and lets them out and the guy's going to kill himself. And Paul's like, no, we haven't run away. We're still here. Um, and he then leads him back to his house and all of his family, seeing these miracles, they all get saved. Um, the whole family repent and come to God. So that was where we left them. Um, Paul told the um, the Roman prison owners there that um, he's actually a Roman citizen. Because Paul is from, people think that Paul often think he knows just a Jew from Jerusalem, but <laughs> Paul is actually from um, here, Tarsus, you know, obviously you hear Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And Tarsus was actually um, a part of Turkey. It still is, it's still, in, it's still, it's still there, it's still called Tarsus today, um, in a region called Sicilia. So, Turkey, well, Sicilia and, and Tarsus specifically, they were free Roman cities under the Roman Empire. So Paul was actually born as a Roman citizen. So he wasn't, um, you know, the Jews in Judea, they were a subjected people. They didn't have the same sort of rights. But Paul was actually born as a Roman, as a to Jewish parents in a free city of Rome. So he had the rights that came with being a Roman. So you'll see that happen quite often. Have you gone better ready? No, do you have another one of these tables in the job? This is the table. Uh, yeah, loads of, loads of stuff like that. Um, so we see what happens quite often is when Paul was getting unfairly treated because the Jews are falsely accused him and he gets um, imprisoned and he gets beaten and stuff, he's like, I'm a Roman. And then they're like, uh-oh, we're not actually allowed to. They just assume he's a Jew and they can treat him how he wants. But he says that he's a Roman and then they're like, uh-oh, we're going to get in trouble for this because we're you know, mistreating a Roman citizen. So um, this is what happens at the end here, you see in verse 38. They were afraid when they heard they were Romans. This is Paul and Silas. Um, so they came in and treated them, and they brought them out, and they asked them to leave the city. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. When they had seen the brothers, they exhorted them and departed. So that's where we got to in Acts 16. So moving on now to Acts 17. So we're doing Acts 17 and 18 up to verse 22, which then brings us up to when Paul writes the letter to the Thessalonians. So and now in Thessalonica, you can see it says in verse 1 uh, of Acts 17, when they travelled through Am Amphilopolis and Apollina, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So you can see here, again, coast of Greece, Philippi, Amphilus, Apollia and Thessalonica. And then they go on to Berea, back through Athens, which is still in Greece there. Um, Corinth, that's obviously letters to Corinthians also in Greece. And then they start heading back then into Turkey to some of the famous churches like Ephesus and whatnot, which in Galatia. In Galatia. Um, and then Paul then later on writes the letters to them. So that's, that sets our scene. So they're in Thessalonica. When they travelled through Amphipolis and Apollina, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. According to his custom, Paul went in. And on three Sabbaths, he lectured to them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. 
So yeah, this is this is Paul's pattern. Um, and this, this is how he was regularly doing evangelism. Um, he was going into the synagogue on the Sabbath and trying to convince the Jews to begin with all the time. That was his main thing. There are often Gentiles there as well. Um, it would be kind of the equivalent today, and this is something that I keep seeing more and more and I'm wondering if God wants me to do, is going into churches on Sundays um, and trying to stir up and wake up and preach to the some of the people there. That might just be, you know religious and the kind of born Christian, so to speak, like the Jews were, and they, they kind of think that they're just because they were christened as a baby and their parents are Christians and they say they're Christian, um, trying to actually stir people up in a similar way, because this is kind of the, that's sort of the equivalent thing. Um, a lot a lot of personal persecution would come with it, but... Is there any way of making it a little bit bigger? Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. sorry. No, Every time I um, change chapter, it goes back to its sort of default and actually there's a font as well. Right, so yeah, so he was always going into synagogues and preaching from the scriptures to them to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, some of them were persuaded, we're on verse 4, some of them were persuaded and they joined with Paul and Silas, including a great crowd of devout Greeks and many leading women. So this is Greek Gentiles who are going to the synagogues and listening. But the Jews who did not believe became jealous, and taking some evil men from the marketplace, they gathered a crowd. They stirred up the city and attacked the house of Jason. So this is where Paul and Silas are staying trying to bring them out to the mob. But when they did not find them, being Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some, and some brothers to the city officials, crying out, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. They are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. So, uh, that was a kind of a lie, because... It's true. We know that that's true, but essentially they are the Jews are twisting what the gospel is to try and get Paul and Silas arrested by the officials there and get them in trouble. Because um, you'll see, like often that the officials who are in charge of this stuff, being the Romans, they don't care about disputes about the scriptures between Jews. They're like, there's nothing to do with us. Basically, you argue about religion all you want, um, but they often try to say that Paul was like. A rioter and causing problems and and you know making doctrines that were going against Caesar and all this stuff, um, so they could get him arrested, but they often find out that's you know that's not the case. So um, yeah, they're trying to make out that Paul's trying to incite a rebellion and saying that there's a king that's going to overthrow Caesar, um, which we know that Jesus will. He is the king, but that his kingdom at this time was uh, was spiritual and wasn't any particular threat to the Romans. Uh, so, verse 8, they troubled the crowd and the city officials when they heard these things. When they'd taken a bail payment from Jason and the rest, they released them. The apostles in Berea. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with all eagerness, daily examining the scriptures to find out if these things were so. So this is quite an important little verse here. It's quite a famous one, um, Acts 17, 11. That it's just saying that the Jews who were in Thessalonica, um, sorry, the Jews that were in Berea, the Bereans, or Bereans, they, uh, it says that they were noble because they didn't just, they received the word eagerly, but they didn't just take Paul's word for it. They, they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were true, and they, they get an accolade for that. So it's saying that's that's what we're to do as well. We're to, to daily examine the scriptures. When we hear stuff, when we're told things, we should check the scriptures if, if what we're hearing is true, basically. Test it against the word of God. So, you know, that was added by the Holy Spirit to just to give us a bit of an example of what it's just promoting these men and saying that they were noble for doing so. Um, so verse 12, Therefore many of them believed. So because... When they examined the scriptures to see if these things were true, 
they saw, yeah, the, you know, the prophets um, and the Psalms and the whole, uh, the law, all of it is pointing towards the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and he has fulfilled all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. Um, therefore, many of them believed, including honourable Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, so these are the guys from before who tried to get him arrested, they came there also, so they've come on down to Berea as well, and stirred up the crowds again. The brothers immediately sent Paul away to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and departed with instructions for Silas and Timothy to come quickly. So just keep in mind that you've got Paul, Silas and Timothy together because it start, that's how Thessalonians' letter starts as well. So Paul now has gone down to Athens, obviously being um, a major city in Greece to, to today, the same name. So Paul waited for Silas and Timothy in Athens. His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Obviously the ancient Greek pantheon, they worship many, many gods for lots of things. Um, you'd have heard about, heard about Zeus and um, you know Hercules and all the various pantheon of gods. Um, there it is. So you've got in, see this little icon here? This is like icons from the ancient world. So down there you've got Pyramid of Giza, the, the Phobos lighthouse in Egypt. Um, that little lump there is the mausoleum at Helicanius in Turkey. Then there's the great thing at Ephesus where Paul does a speech. And then there's a statue of Greece um, on the coast there, one of the sort of ancient wonders of the world at Mount Olympia. Um, so yeah, so there would have been, you know, this is ancient Greece and they had many, many, many gods um, and many idols. So this is what Paul's seeing. So he sees the city is full of idols. Therefore, verse 17, therefore he disputed in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Um, that's a kind of daily in the marketplace. That's a bit of a um, example of what's given for modern evangelism um, going, you know, similar to what um, Brother Bruce does, kind of going into the into the Broadmead daily in the same place to like have that reliable witness there. Yeah, exactly. So this is the first sort of example of Paul doing evangelism that isn't going into the synagogues. Um, so then, verse 18, so then some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, so these are two branches of Greek philosophy back then, they encountered Paul and some said, what will this babbler say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because Paul was preaching Jesus and the resurrection to them. They took hold of him and they led him to the Areopagus, saying, this is like a, an open ground temple thing for, for debating. May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, because you are bringing strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time in nothing else but either telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I passed by and looked up at your objects of worship, I found an altar with this inscription, To the Unknown God. This is quite an important thing for evangelism as, as well, that he's um, he's meeting them where they're, they are and he's using where they're current, their current understanding of like religion to preach the gospel. I mean, he's finding some common ground and it's a common thing that um, you can do with, you know, with Muslims, with Hindus, with Buddhists. You like try and find some common ground to begin with. You don't go in like, you're wrong, everything you believe is wrong, you know, you're, you're worshipping demons because they're just like, it just shuts the door straight away. If you can find some commonality to, to then preach Jesus and try and make them see, see a bigger picture, um, yeah, it's a much more effective way of doing it. It happens quite a lot when I meet people and help them think of this and I meet people who um, believe in other, other gods. Uh, I looked up at your objects of worship and I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. 
whom you therefore unknowingly worship. It is him that I am proclaiming to you. 24. God, who made the world and all the things in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, he does not live in temples made by hands, nor is he served by men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives life, he gives all men life and breath and all things. He has made from one blood every nation of men to live on the entire face of the earth, having appointed fixed times and the boundaries of their habitation. So that's a, that's a an important little bit of doctrine then about the Lord, um, that he has appointed the times for every kingdom and their borders and their rise and fall of all these nations, like the Babylonian Empire and the, the Persian Empire, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire. He's determined the rise and fall, how far they'll go, how successful they'll be, equally up to the British Empire, how the boundaries of that, and then our time for them to withdraw. They gave all the countries back their independence, etc. Um, yeah, the Lord is over all of this and he's planned it all out. So verse 27. The boundaries of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, so perhaps they might reach for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, because in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to suppose that the deity is like gold or silver or stone or an engraved work of art or an image of the reflection of man. God overlooked the times of ignorance, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed having given assurance of this to all men by raising him from the dead. So, yeah, this is, um, as, as like Brother Thomas will see, this is quite a common, um, quite a common evangelical theme that comes up. People ask about what about other gods and, you know, we get lots of um, wannabe philosophers kind of thinking all these things and asking questions about this sort of thing. But, um, yeah, the truth is that, as it says, verse 30, that God has um, he tolerated this ignorance um, for thousands of years. He's put up with people thinking that there's 50 gods and that they can, you know, that they, you can buy favour with them or that they, they need stuff from us. They need sacrifices to like, they need our prayers to be stronger and all these things that a lot of the... Um, a lot of the Hindu and a lot of the Greek and a lot of the Roman pantheons believe there's multiple gods, which is always bonkers because who made who made each other? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, how did they all just appear at the same time? Like, which one's more powerful? And if any of them, you know, are less, then where did who made those gods? And it's just like, but yeah, essentially, God is, um, you know, He's allowed that. He overlooked the times of ignorance, but now that's enough. Like, He's given. He's appointed a day that he's going to judge the world by Jesus Christ. Um, and he gave proof, and that's what it's all about. Like, a lot of people ask, you know, I always say to people that um, the resurrection is everything, actually. If it wasn't for the resurrection, Christianity wouldn't exist. Because there were many prophets before Jesus who did miraculous things, like Elijah and, and Moses and Elisha and, you know, Jonah and all these people. But they died, and that was the end of them, and nothing more came of them, you know? So it's just like, oh, it's just another prophet. The difference with Jesus Christ was obviously that he was the Son of God, but that he rose from the dead, and that was the assurance to all men that there is a, res a resurrection from the dead, and that God will resurrect and judge the world in righteousness. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, nothing would have happened. There wouldn't have been all of this. Christianity wouldn't have spread out of Jerusalem across all the world, essentially. All these thousands of people who you know, were willing to be persecuted and murdered and tortured and die because they had seen Jesus Christ and they believed and knew that he'd risen from the dead. Because he appeared to hundreds of people over a period of 40 days. Um, so yeah, it all, it all comes back to the resurrection. And without the resurrection, we don't have any hope. 
you know, this everything's in vain. Uh, which the scriptures say the same. So verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed. So it's no different 2,000 years later, it's the exact same thing today. But others said, we will hear you again concerning this matter. It's the same reaction you get today. Some people ask questions and are willing to hear more. Nothing's changed over thousands of years, and some said, nah, <laughs> nothing's changed. So Paul departed from them. However, some men joined him and believed. Praise God. Among them was Dio um, Dionysus, the Arapagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Uh, thank you, Lord, for those people. Two verses on this. So, so on chapter 18. Is that okay? Yeah, cool. So Paul now is going to Corinth, where they obviously the quite notoriously um, naughty church that there's two very strong letters about conduct too. Um, yeah, Corinth is here on this very large island south of Athens in Greece. I think it still might be called Corinth to this day. So Paul leaves Athens and goes to Corinth. And there you've got a couple of well-known characters that appear several times in Acts. He found a Jew named Aquil Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. So you've got Aquila and Priscilla. Yeah, they're quite well known. Um, because Claudius, who was the emperor, I think, at the time, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to them. And because he was of the same trade, he remained with them and worked. For they were tent makers by trade. So Paul, um, people often wonder about, you know, how did he support his ministry and everything. Paul worked really hard. He was a tent maker. He was a skilled tent maker. And that was a thing back then. A lot of people lived in tents. Um, and Aquila and Priscilla were also tent makers. Um, they worked together. And that fact being mentioned now comes up in um, in Thessalonians twice, actually. Um, and it talks about, Paul goes into detail about how he, he paid his own way and worked hard and was working with others to fund his own stuff so he, he wouldn't be chargeable to them, even though he had the right to because he was a minister of God and he's... he's um, you know, an apostle, and he's and he's raising his church. He said, oh, "I didn't take anything from you. I I worked, you know, night and day, <laughs> so I didn't have to charge anything to you." As an so, I could give you a good example of what you guys should be doing, how you should all work hard and, and pay your own way. Um, that comes up. So it's interesting that this is mentioned now, and it's this is at the same time when Paul writes. So he's moved on to Corinth, but he writes. He always goes backwards when he moves on. He then writes letters to the people he's just left. Can't you really see that mm -hmm. regularly? Um, so he's writing back. He's in Corinth, but he hasn't written to the Corinthians yet. He writes to the Thessalonians soon, which we'll read in a minute. So now, remember, he'd left Silas and um, Timothy. And verse 5 now, they'd come and met up with him again. So when T Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul was pressed by the Holy Spirit. And we all know what that's like, I think. Um, Yes, that's a good way of putting it. I think conviction sometimes, conviction is often about sin, but I know sometimes, you know, when you feel like the Holy Spirit is just like burdening you with something to say or do, and you get, you feel like I have to say it, I think that's quite a good way of putting it, pressed by the Holy Spirit. I know what, that, I know what that's like. Uh, Paul was pressed by the Holy Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they opposed him and they blasphemed, he shook out his garments. This is quite a key moment now. He was previously just going to the synagogues. He shook out his garments and he said to them, Your blood be upon your heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he's, he's but essentially he's had enough. And he's finding that when he's going into these synagogues and preaching Christ, the most people that are believing him and coming to faith are the Greeks and the Gentile like proselytes there. They're not actually even Jewish people. And he's saying, like, I've had enough, like you your heart your hearts are so hardened, you're not even believing in your own sight. Eh? You know, I'm just gonna go after the Gentiles and preach to the, the Romans and the Greeks and the Italians and everything, the Turks and everything like that now. 
because um, they're the ones who actually have, you know, God is, and we know that like Paul learns later on when he writes his great, when he writes Romans, his great treatise on faith, he goes into detail. Um, he talks about how sad he is that the Jews are rejecting Christ. But he realizes that God reveals to him that it's, God has hardened the hearts of the Jews so that salvation can come to the Gentiles until all the Gentiles that will be saved believe and then he will then open the heart of the Jews again to receive the Christ and that will be, be the end. So this is all planned out. You see that in Romans chapter uh, 8, 9, 10. It goes into great detail about why God made them not believe in Jesus. It was for our benefit. Wasn't Paul in the spirit of the Gentiles? Yes. That was in the heart. Yeah, he was he was specifically from birth called to be an apostle for the Gentiles um, to bring salvation to us. Praise God. Are you going back out, babe? Okay. All sorts of things they found. <laughs> These peanuts though are very dangerous. Once you start you can stop. <laughs> yeah, nice things roll. Yeah, sales guys to whatever and have a little a little browse as we go in. No, we're getting over. So yeah, Paul's cheesed off now. He's had enough of the the, gen, uh, the Jews blaspheming and, and hardening the heart against Christ. And he's dusted off his he shook out his garments and he said, um, your blood be upon your heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I'm going to go to the Gentiles because he's finding that the only ones who actually believe him when he goes to the synagogues, the Greeks and the um, Italians and the, you know, the Gentiles in the synagogues. So. Do you want me to put my phone up and say people see that? No, it's okay. I can I can like zoom this in and everything. Yeah. Do you think? Yeah. You can do if you like. Yeah. If you catch us up, you just, yeah, take over from yourself. We're on Acts uh, 18, so verse 7. He departed from them, and he entered into the house of a man named Justus, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with his entire household, and many of the Corinthians who heard believed and were baptised. Oh yeah, that's massive now. So we're on um, verse 8. Yeah, cool. Believed and baptised. So the Lord, so he's still in Corinth now. And there's a big, there was a big church in the Corinthians. Uh, the Lord spoke to Paul in the night through a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent. For I am with you and no one shall attack you and hurt you. For I have many people in this city. That's nice. Jesus giving Paul some nice uh, comfort and reassurance there. To not fear. So for a year and six months he sat among them teaching the word of God. So you can see this is why when Paul is writing to the first and second Corinthians to them, um, you can tell like they're people that he really knows well and he cares about, and you can see why because he spent a year and a half with them in Corinth, getting to know all these people. Um, and that's why he says, like, he was really grieved and upset to have to send these strong letters telling them, like, you need to kick this guy out of your fellowship and, you know, the things that happened in Corinthians are very strong meanings. And he says, he even says in Second Corinthians that I've written this letter with, like, much grief and many tears about the situation. Because he probably knows these people by name who he's on about. And he's really sad that they've fallen so badly and doing such grievous stuff. Like, you know, a guy sleeping with his half-mother or something, or a stepmother or whatever it is, is his father's wife he's absolutely like destroyed about it he talks about that with Ephesians as well he says that um, we see that in Thessalonians I think it is um, no it's in Acts he um, he talks to them about how when he leaves he's crying about it when he's leaving because he knows the Lord has showed him that um, wolves are going to come in basically teaching false things and like lead people astray into really grievous stuff and he's like warning them about it and like crying because he knows that they're just as soon as he goes they're just going to go back to Satan basically and start doing terrible things and be sad about it. But and we've experienced that quite recently as well with people who are on the mm. on the straight and narrow while you're with them and then you wish they could just stay with you and then as soon as they go back in the world they just they just fall back away again. It is very painful. So I know how he feels. 
was going to say, sorry, um, Clifford, is, it, is Corinth, is that a city or the island? It's the big old, it's a big, it's you a show, big city. Is it the whole island? Is the whole that island you showed before? I don't think No, it's, it's a like city a on this big old piece, yeah. Oh, okay. so it's like a city. Yeah, it's a big old, big old city and an area. Yeah, a major city. So, um, yeah, so he stayed in Corinth for a year and six months. He sat among them teaching the word of God. That's cool. So he'd be going through all the Old Testament and teaching them. So when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, whatever that is, the Jews in unity, oh, that must that's probably this region is Achaia, that big island. So Galileo is the, the proconsul of Achaia. The Jews in unity attacked Paul and they brought him to court saying, this man is persuading men to worship God contrary to the law. When Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, O oh Jews, if it were a matter of, a, of misdemeanor or a serious crime, I would rightly bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names in your law, look into it yourselves, for I do not intend to be a judge of these matters. So Gallio is the Roman proconsul, and it, that's what we talked about earlier. He's like, I don't care about your religious yeah, argument. Of pilot when... Yeah, yeah, similar yeah. things. Like, I don't care about your arguments about. Paul hasn't done anything wrong against Roman law just because he's saying that stuff about your law, this Jesus, is not, none of our interest. We should keep trying to, you know, accuse him of these things. This is nothing to do with us. So he drove them out of the court, all the Jews that were accusing Paul. Then all the Greeks seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him before the judgment seat. So this is a bit of a gentile um, um, retaliation against the Jews because they're getting, trying to get Paul in trouble but none of these things matter to Gallio so he just he just doesn't care about what these guys are going on so Paul now leaves and goes back to northern Syria to Antioch close to actually where he's from being Tarsus so verse 18 Paul remained many days he had cut his hair in Centraea for he had taken a vow then bidding farewell to the brothers he sailed to Syria and Priscilla and Aquila were with him, so they stayed together now, which is nice. So he's not made a vow to cut his hair. So that's something from the Old Testament law, like if you made a vow, if it was like a Nazarene vow, when you fulfilled it, um, you had to shave your eyebrows off, shave your hair. So I don't know why he's what vow he's made or why, but um, it was part of the Old Testament Jewish law that if you made a vow, you had to cut your hair. But I don't think he was doing it because he was kind of keeping the law. I think it's also a Jewish About of tradition, appearances. Of tradition as well. Yeah, he probably did it to show someone that he was mean. When he says, "I became a Jew to the Jews, a Gentile to the Gentiles, etc., a Greek to the Greeks," to like not offend anybody in anything. So, like, yeah, he kind of did these things just to from evangelical reasons most of the time. We, we see that a bit later on, where it says about you got to cleanse yourself and everything. We see that. Uh, I think it might be. No, it's not in this study, it's in a next time, I think. Yeah, further on in Acts, it talks a bit about that. Um, so he goes to Syria, Priscilla and Aquila with him. He arrived at Ephesus and left them there. So obviously Ephesus, that's the, the um, letter to the Ephesians, that's in Turkey. Um, he left Priscilla and Aquila at Ephesus, but he himself went into the synagogue and lectured the Jews. When they asked him to remain for a while longer, he did not consent. But bidding farewell, he said, I must by all means attend this upcoming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, which is in Ju uh, Judea, Jerusalem, um, in Israel, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and passed through the entire region of Galatia and Phrygia in sequence, strengthening all the disciples. Okay, so while he's there, he writes to the Thessalonians. So um, we can see. Oh, you haven't got the. Are we going Thessalonians? That's why I wanted my this really, so I can just tab back. On Discord, isn't it? No, it's on. It's not on. The map. No, but you could get that other map up for that. But it might be with me to take over the screen for a second. It's on general chat. Shall I just take over the screen quickly? Right, so I'm 
Where's the, is it the green line? Let's take the second one. Yeah, so green line, come up here, Philippi, he was at the, that was the Bereans who were noble because they took plus the scriptures. Then he was in Athens, Corinth, sailed back, Ephesus that we were just talked about there. That's a Corinth in Greece. Yeah, yeah, Corinth in Greece, Athens, it doesn't really get Athens, it's yeah. Ephesus. Ephesus is in, you can't really tell what the water is, that's not a river, that's all white. But this is the land, <laughs> this is the water, Aegean Sea, Sea of Crete, right? So Ephesus on the coast, and then he's just been talking to those Ephesians there, and he said they wanted to stay, and he's like, I can't, I've got to go to the Greeks. So he heads off by sea, through Rhodes, and sails back down to Jerusalem, and says he goes back up to Antioch, um, before going back through um, Galatia. While he's in Antioch, he writes to the Thessalonians. We're going to Thessalonians now. Yeah. Thessalonians chapter 1. Let me know when you're, you're all ready. Yeah. Sounds like. Well done. It's nice following Paul's footsteps when you read through the New Testament because you, I think you have to feel get a feel for it, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Feel like I'm with him. Mm. Like if he's stopping now and he's sitting and he's writing this letter now, I feel like I'm sat next to him while he writes. It just makes like when you go for this is only obviously the second epistle we've done, but when you get into the epistles through Acts, when you see more and more, you can just see the the doctrine and the understanding like building based on what's happened. So um, we obviously did Galatians last time, but mm. the one before that, which was online before we came here, we covered James, so that was the first one that was written. Um, I posted a link for it, I don't know if anyone had time to listen to that one, um, the James one. If not, we might have to do James again at the end. But James is great. It is, yeah, and there's so much depth of, of knowledge in there. So, so what was What's an epistle? Um, sorry, yeah, that's no, no. a letter, basically. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, okay. yeah, that yeah. either you know the books of the Bible, yeah, yeah. like the epistles, they get yeah, called yeah. as well because they're letters. Okay. Yeah, um, okay. yeah. So, so, they're known like often. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John known as the Gospels. Yeah, yeah. Acts is just known as Acts because it's not really an epistle. But then the rest of it are epistles. Yeah. So Paul, Silas, and Timothy, who we been hearing about and they're all back together at the moment to the church of the Thessalonians which we know is in Thessalonica which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ the Thessalonians faith and example we give thanks to God always for you mentioning you in our prayers remembering without ceasing your work of faith labour of love and your patient hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. Yeah, so this is, they were quite a strong, he was quite pleased, they were quite a strong church at this point. Um, yeah, they've got faith, love and patience. So, verse 4. For we know, beloved brothers, your election by God that word again we can see through all, every almost through the gospels through acts through every single scripture there's just constant talk about um you know the doctrine of of election of predestination of being chosen by god for salvation um he talks about it a lot in these two epistles as well uh we know brothers your election by god your choice your you know your, yeah your promotion what you think about the word election we elect um politicians right we vote for them and they get elected to, to things that's what that word means um, for our gospel did not come to you in word only but also in power and in the holy spirit and in much assurance just as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake um, this is quite a key thing as well about how they know what kind of men they were among them um, it talks about it second in the second letter as well it talks about how 
they were examples to them by their conduct and that they should they should they're not just writing like words to them but look at how we behaved among you and to replicate that and let let how we actually acted among you be a lesson um, so yeah that should be the case for our elders that they should walk be like Christ and walk like Christ and act like him so that they're not just as you said they're not just coming in words but also in power and in you know they're walking the walk um, so you became followers of us and the Lord having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit so these guys obviously we can see the full gospel here that they have received the Holy Spirit therefore you were examples to all who believe in Macedonia and Achaia so this important thing about holy conduct so because the examples of Paul, Silas and Timothy of how they actually acted and behaved that's then taught the Thessalonians to act and behave like them and like the Lord and because of their walk that gives a strong witness and their behavior is then being an example to the Macedonians and the Achaeans um, in an evangelical way because they've seen you know Jesus says let your light shine before men etc and they will people will know you're my disciples because the love you have for one another um, our witness is obviously from our behavior so verse 8 for the word of the Lord sounded out from you not only in Macedonia and in Achaia but also in every place your faith in God has gone forth so that we do not need to say anything um, so if you contrast that with believers today who Apart from the fact that they go to church on a Sunday and might put like a maybe a Christian meme on their Facebook once a month or something, you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily know that they were any different from the rest of the people in the world, you know. Whereas these guys, their life, their conduct, their behaviour was so set apart that everybody was hearing about these people, you know. They were such good, loving, holy people. They were like Christ, so that. The, you know the word of the Lord has sounded out there they're also evangelizing they're preaching the gospel like all of these people so that it's going out into the surrounding regions they're affecting their atmosphere and the people around them and everybody's hearing about these 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 people so when he says um, um so that we do not need to say anything so essentially they don't need so Paul's saying he doesn't need to comment on their conduct yes. at the moment with regards to that yeah because like He's giving everybody back. knows how great you guys are doing oh, cool. because I'm hearing about this from the surrounding regions and what can we say everybody's saying we don't need to say anything everybody's telling like everybody knows that but your love that, so I think that is kind of like his feedback to the churches yeah, yeah. Like and to, to some of the churches it's like very strong yeah. <laughs> and quite you know quite bad to others it's really good and encouragement the Thessalonians they, there's nothing really negative in there, really, that I can think of. There is, oh, there is, he's had some reports about a couple of the bad people who've been lazy, which we'll see about in a minute. So, um, for they themselves declare, so he's talking about the Macedonians and the Canes, they themselves declare how we were received by you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So, yeah, there's, they're seeing their conduct. Um, how you turned to God from idol to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead Jesus this is very important who delivered us from the wrath to come so that's an important thing about and there's a lot in Thessalonians but one and two about the day of the Lord and the rapture um, and there's often there's multiple references to our faith in Christ and our conduct in Christ delivering us from the wrath to come the wrath of God being the second half of the Great Tribulation, the three and a half years to the end, which is when the wrath of God is poured out, and that is detailed in the book of Revelation. It's like fire um, coming down from the sky. Isn't yeah, there's a lot of, you know, plagues, and it's very similar to what happens in Egypt. They actually mirror the seven plagues that Moses put upon Egypt in that time are the same seven plagues that God pours out on the world at large, and not just on Egypt. Um, in the last three and a half years of tribulation and that's why I believe in a either a pre or mid tribulation um, hub hazard uh, because we we are delivered from the wrath to come and 
it says in the settings we've not been appointed to the back of that, which we will see in a minute. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul's ministry in Thessalonica. You yourselves know, brothers, that our visit to you was not in vain. But even after we had previously suffered and were shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, he's talking about where they got locked up and imprisoned and everything and beaten and the earthquake situation that we saw about. We were shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know. We were bold in our God to declare to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. So he's referring to the persecution they had there from the Jews. For our exhortation was not from deceit, nor from uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not to please men, but God who examines our hearts. That is very important little thing there. Obviously the Bible says this sort of thing many times, but everything we do, we should not be doing to please men or for the praise of men. We need to check our motives. We need to be doing things to please God because God examines our hearts. He knows the truth. He knows why we're really doing things. He knows the secret motivations of our heart. Um, nobody else does, including the devil. It's only God who can read our thoughts and see our hearts and know what we're doing things. So that's the key thing. We have to always examine and check our heart. And our heart, as the Bible says, can be, um, the heart is deceitful above all things and is, and is uh, wicked. Who can know it? So we really have to examine ourselves and check the motivations of our heart that we're doing things not to be men pleasers, uh, but to please to please God. So this is what he's talking about. Yeah? yeah, not doing what we want to do because yeah. you know we like it, or to make other people think that we're holy or righteous or good. But we need to do it for God alone. And that's what he's talking about here. So we're not doing it to not for deceit, not for gain, not from cleanness, not in guile. But we speak so to please God. For neither at any time did we come with flattering words as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. This is what we get a lot of teachers and things today, a lot of people doing things for, for greed, a lot of people out there to, you know, serve, they serve God to make money, or well, they're not even serving God, they get into things, they get into ministry for with a pretext for greed. And that often comes with flattering words, telling people what we want to hear, flattering people to try and get, the, get what they want. God is our witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, or either from you or from others, even though we might have made demands as the apostles of Christ, saying we have the right to, and talked about that a lot, but we were gentle among you, like a nurse caring for her own children. What a wonderful um, description that is there, like you can really, it connects like what they would have actually, and what they would have been like, like that's how gentle they were, like a nurse caring for her own children, that's like, and obviously, nurse caring for her own children is very loving, very, very patient, very gentle, you know. Um, so, so having great love towards you, great love, we were willing to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you were dear to us. So they were saying we, they were willing to give their own lives for these people. That was how great love they had for them. These evangelists, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, bringing the gospel. For you remember, brothers, our labour and our toil. We laboured night and day. That's when he was talking about feet. So this is the working as a tent maker. He worked night and day, so not as to be any expense to any of you. We preached to you the gospel of God. So they didn't, you know, they're there working full time ministering to these people, and uh, not getting paid at all any of them. Instead, just working. Night shift, day shifts, every time, you know, whenever they can, so that they didn't charge anything to the Thessalonians. You and God are witnesses of how pure, upright, and blameless we ourselves behaved among you who believe. So this is how our evangelists and our apostles and our teachers and our um, elders and leaders need to be. Completely pure, upright, and blameless. And that's not only among the church, that's your reputation among others, we see in uh, Titus and Timothy, it says. Otherwise, see the hypocrisies find it again. Yeah. So you see that, look at the, um, see that coming out all the time, the Hillsong things, the Catholic Church, we get priests get, you know, found out that they've been 
doing abominable abuses of children and horrific things that just completely destroyed like all reputation of so many people completely you know yeah completely hate um the catholic church because if they've just seen these decades of um of abuses and things that have been hidden up by the vatican itself um and they've hidden they've not you know not only did they not um confront this and kind of out this priest for example they work all work together to hide it and move them onto an, and don't even kick them out move them to another church where they're not known about and then like don't tell anybody and do you know what i mean like that happened what amazing documentary about that called um spotlight, spotlight yeah it's really worth a watch yeah. spotlight kind of really gives like brings you up to date with what's happening which is yeah but i'm i'm not even you know not picking on catholicism it's happened within you know evangelicalism and protestantism as well like look at hillsong recently is a good example so many um big names over the there's years. There's a documentary coming out for Hillsong, isn't there? Is it ready out there? Yeah, there is a documentary about, about the it's sexual really... assaults and rapes and things from the leadership of Hillsong. Like, really... Hillsong is a big um, evangelical kind of Protestant um, worship church based from Australia um, who recently, yeah, big scandals come out about the, majority that. Of the leadership of modern been... worship music is probably originally written by Hillsong. Yeah. Um, but I've never liked like they've they've done some good songs, but yeah. I've never um like the way never liked it because as soon as you see the video, it's like everybody's worshiping them, and it just looks like the world. It's like a band on stage, and was like, yeah, it just looks like a rock concert. But the lyrics are good. It's good songs. Yeah, so you yeah, just yeah, listen yeah. to the music Crazy. and the, and check the lyrics. But they themselves, I would never go to a concert or anything like that because it's just anything of God shouldn't look anything like the world. Um, anyway. So we preach to you, we laboured night and day, so we wouldn't be any expense to you, we preach to you the gospel of God. You and God are witnesses of how pure, upright and blameless we ourselves behaved among you who believe. As you know, we exhorted, comforted and commanded every one of you, like a father does his own children. So that's important to know that a lot of people don't mind the exhortation and comfort, but get an, anything towards commands and people are like hey, judging me people get very upset but it's just saying like a father does his own children exhort comfort and command but remembering the beginning sorry verse seven like a nurse caring for her own children with love like a father does her own children not with um, cruelty or harshness or condemnation but with, with love and gentleness but in truth so um we exhorted comfort and commanded you that you would walk in a manner worthy of God, who has called you to his kingdom and his glory. So you'll see the common theme, it was similar in Galatians, same in James, same in this. It's all about holiness, encouraging people to walk like Christ and be pure and blameless and upright and actually, yeah, be like Jesus and not just, um, you know, you're saved now, so live how you want. So verse 13, for this reason, we thank God without ceasing because... When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you received it not as the word of men, but you received it as it truly is, which is the word of God, which effectively works also in you who believe. So the word of God, as we know, is a sharp two-edged sword and is alive, and it effectively works in those who believe. Which is why we read together and let it go into our hearts, because the word of God is active and living and powerful and it changes us. Uh, for you, brothers, you became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. You also, obviously just talking there about the, um, you know, Peter and John and everybody and James back in, in, uh, in Judea, in Jerusalem. Um, he's saying that they're emulating the behaviour of the Christians there. You also have suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they have from the Jews. Um, so they're, he's talking about they're getting persecuted. In the same way as the persecution that's happened in Jerusalem. Uh, from the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and they killed their own prophets and they have persecuted us. They do not please God and they are contrary to all men. They are even forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. In this way they are always piling up their sins but wrath has come upon them to the extreme. Um, so yeah this is why it's important for us to always pray for Israel. Pray for the Jewish people that God would have mercy on them. 
and that you will um, forgive them for what they did and uh, open their hearts basically to, to receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah and Saviour. Um, yeah, because well, yeah, of this. Made me, I, I never used to understand why I should pray for Israel, but I knew that you know, we were called to. So we saw Israel, God comes to bless Israel. But in my heart, I didn't really understand until um, Marcus and I did a Bible study. And he explained that God hardened Israel's hearts so that the Gentiles would have a period of grace. Yeah. So like, the, and that means like, we have an opportunity, and some Jews do, because you do get some Messianic Jews. Yeah, there. more and more recently. Praise we God. have an opportunity to be raptured and to avoid the wrath. But the majority of Israel will remain on that last three and a half years and have to endure the wrath of God. Yeah. Um, essentially die for their faith. Um, and that has happened because God hardened their hearts so that we could hear the gospel, so that we could have a period of grace, the Gentiles. So that made me then think, wow, yeah, okay, now I can really pray for Israel, like from my heart. Because mm. I didn't need to go to each gent. Yeah, it's easy to do. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So yeah, they are always piling up their sins and wrath has come upon them to the extreme. Verse 17, Paul's desire to visit again. But we brothers, I think he does go back to Thessalonica as well on his third visit. So we brothers being taken from you for a short time in presence, but not in heart, we endeavoured all the more abundantly to see your face. Sad. Yeah, she often goes to sleep for about half an hour, wake up, cry for 10 minutes, or let's sleep again for some reason. Sometimes. A, she comes, yeah, spend my mum's day in the night and then bring it. So I, I always knew that that would be a good um, I endeavoured all the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wish to come to you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Um, I think that's talked about when he got imprisoned, didn't he? He got, he got chased and attacked by the by the Jews and they had to sail off back to that's what happened at the end of verse um, at the end of chapter 17 sorry at the end of 18 Satan hindered us for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing will it not even be you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming you are our glory and joy so this is talking about how our, our um, main rewards our main crown and basis of rewards will be the people that we have um brought to the Lord, our, our fruits of our evangelism, our harvest, they're going to be our main glory and joy when the, when the Lord comes. The people that we've witnessed to and we've seen come to the Lord will be um, very much rewarded for the people that we've taken the part in of coming, whether that was planting the seed or it was watering the seed that's had a part before, or even baptising people or bringing people who are on the verge like in, or even just helping people grow in the Lord and yeah, helping people along. That'll be those people like Pin, for example, they're our um, hope and our joy and our crown of rejoicing. So, chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and minister of God, that's the, the obviously Timothy they met up in Derb about a year or so ago. We sent Timothy, who is our brother, a minister of God, and he is our fellow labourer in the gospel of Christ, to establish and comfort you with regard to your faith. Um, just in case anyone doesn't know, that's obviously Timothy, who first and second Timothy are written to. They sent him. They so they sent Timothy to establish and comfort you with regard to your faith, so that no one would be shaken by these afflictions. For you know that we are appointed to this. So this is talking about, this is about suffering for the sake of the gospel. That was an important thing as well, that the sufferings and afflictions that are referred to are always for the sake of the gospel. We are not to suffer in the hands of the devil. We're not to suffer in the hands of Satan. Um, if we are, it's, it's not for us and we shouldn't be. Um, it might be a form of, like we talked about in Corinthians, about 
the man being handed over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh is because he was in grievous sin and he was in rebellion against God. Um, it's not God's will for us. Say, Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. So we shouldn't be suffering at the hands of the devil. Um, all the suffering and afflictions he talked about is suffering for the sake of the gospel. Suffering persecution from people who oppose Christ, his kingdom, like the gospel. Hatred, mocking, yeah, defending. stoning, defending, afflictions, imprisonment, yeah. people hating you, you know, things like that. Because of the testimony of Jesus Christ, because you're a Christian. Because you're, you know, because of the gospel, because of your faith, basically, that is the persecution and suffering that we are supposed, to, that we will endure, that that will happen when you truly stand for God and stand for Christ and you witness and people know that you will you will be persecuted in that way. But you'll be rejoicing in persecutions because suffering for say from the hands of Satan is due to illness and poverty and stuff like that, isn't it? Yeah, things like that, sickness, illness, yeah. poverty, human suffering, yeah. prison punishments you know things getting in trouble for breaking laws and stuff like that that's um that's not the suffering that we we should have so when i um hear people kind of suffering in those ways and saying oh well you know christ said we'd suffer i'm just like not no. not in that way he came to destroy that that's a curse you're kind of bringing this on yourself a lot of the time yeah persecution because of the gospel yeah Not what but we shouldn't, yeah, that's, that's not God's will. That's not God's will. That's the suffering will. from Satan, that is. Because he became, yeah, obviously, yeah, not saying that that won't happen, but it's not It's not for us. We shouldn't accept it. Christ became a curse for us. Yeah, um, yeah these things certainly can and do happen, sadly, but yeah. it's not something that we just say, oh, well, you know, you know, Christians are going to suffer under curses. Yeah. That's, yeah, it's not for us at all. Yeah, absolutely. Because we're growing in our Christian faith. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, and all of that stuff, because we know it's not God's will, can and will be broken by the power of the name of Jesus Christ and from us from coming to God, yeah. Um I think it's I think some people like especially like people I know that in like Poverty-stricken countries, they'll always say, "Oh well, we're supposed to suffer and everything." That's what the Bible says, but that's not what that's that's not what the Bible's saying. It's saying um, we, suffering and saying that we will is for the gospel. Yeah, I see that every time. Yeah. So Jesus is, said is, the same. All the apostles say the same. Whenever they're talking about sufferings and afflictions and things, it's always from it's well, nine times out of ten, it's from the hands of the Jews, basically mm. um, persecuting because of because of Jesus. So where were we? Which verse are we on? Halfway through three. Um, you know that you're a son of God when you believe in Christ as well. Oh yeah, verse three. I thought you meant, because we're on chapter three as well, halfway through three, I thought you meant the chapter. I was like, okay. Um, yeah, indeed, we told you before that we were with you, that we should suffer tribulation, just as it came to pass, as you well know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to inquire about your faith. At least by some means the tempter might have tempted you. That's talking about Satan there. Uh, or one of his, you know, one of the men of the unclean spirits or fallen angels. Uh, the tempter might have tempted you and our labour might have been in vain. But just now, Timothy has come from you to us and has brought us good news of your faith and love. Those were the keys. Good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good memories of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also desire to see you. Therefore, brothers, during all our afflictions and distress, we have been encouraged about you through your faith. For now we live, if you stand strong in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sakes before our God, night and day praying earnestly that we might see your face and might perfect that which, which is lacking in your faith. Now, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all men, 
even as we do for UTC, like yeah. how, again, that's another repeated thing throughout all the, all the Gospels and all the epistles, talking about love all the time, um, and how, you know, love for, for one another is the most important thing. Um, we see that again and again and again. That the greatest and most, and Jesus obviously said the exact same thing, the, the greatest commandment, uh, a new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. Um, I think it's important to stress here as well, because I think uh, we've been in um, gatherings where it's been said by um, other teachers that faith is the most important thing, but that's wrong. It's not the best teacher. Um, love is the most important Yeah, these three remain yeah, faith, hope, and love. Yeah, there's two really clear ones. Yeah. It says um, these three remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these three is love. So it says it's more important than faith and hope. And as you said, even if I have faith to move mountains and give my body to be burned, if, if I don't have love, it's pointless. It doesn't, doesn't gain me anything at all. Um, yeah, and Jesus said the same himself. He says the love is the most important thing. Mm. Yeah, being loved and treating each other well, um, like Christ, how he treated, loved, loved one another as I have loved you and gave myself for you. Um, so verse 11, sorry, verse 12. So this is a prayer and we, for them, and one which we can all pray for ourselves and we'll just quickly you know, say amen to it now. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all men. So not just for the brethren, brethren, even as we do for you. Lord, we pray that for all of our for all of us and for the body of Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Thirteen. To this end, may he establish your hearts to be blameless in holiness before our God and the Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. That's not actually the end. It's not, usually letters end like this, but there's another chapter. But um, yeah, that's not something you hear preached a lot these days, that may God in the congregation establish the hearts of people to be blameless in holiness. You don't even hear like holiness even spoke about like these days anymore. Um, yeah, the Lord's will for us, for us to be blameless in holiness before God at the coming of Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. That's what it's all about. So next chapter, chapter four. A life pleasing to God. This is then, so he just touched on being blameless in holiness and now he goes into great detail of what that looks like <clears throat> and what it is all about. So chapter four, verse one. Finally, brothers, we urge and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as you have learned from us how you ought to walk and to please God, you should excel more and more. This is what we were talking about at the beginning about. They'd seen the example of what it looked like to be a Christian from Paul and from Silas and from Timothy because how how loving and how the way that it says we, we give get, even gave our lives for like for you to to preach to you and help you and show you and we didn't charge anything to you and we were helping. Um, as you've learned from us how you ought to walk and to please the Lord, you should excel in this more and more. For you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That you should, and this is God's will, which is why Jesus you know, came and died for us. So that we could uh, be conformed into the image of his son by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the will of God, your sanctification. That you should abstain from sexual immorality that each one of you should know how to possess his own vessel in that sanctification, yeah, yourself basically, how to be self-controlled, how you should possess, control yourself in sanctification and honour, not in the lust of depravity like the Gentiles do who do not know God. For us, that's like, that's the church today as well. That, um, they just act like the Gentiles, there's no, they just act like the Gentiles who don't know God. They, in the lust of depravity, um, there's no difference really between the world and the church anymore, thanks. Okay. Um, that you've got, you know, 
accuracy survey is that um, that's like I think I was looking at the other day something like sent like seventy percent of men in the church admit to watching pornography like weekly. Yeah, Christians. Yeah, yeah, it's just I like it's there's no different between seventy percent of men in the church admitted to watching pornography regularly. It's the same number as it's the same number as non Christians. Um, yeah, it's just a. Yeah, it's just, they just act like the Gentiles now because of and what Paul's like, teaching. Many are called few are chosen, and that's why few are chosen because. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but it's like. Seventy percent of them watching. Weak, weak teaching as well, watered down teaching, never going through the full truths of the Bible. Yeah, they just choose little bits. It's just the same message, the same milk message over and over again every every week. Well, it's bad now because. I suppose before it was a lot harder to kind of get hold of pornography. Like you could do DVDs and CDs and you'd have to go to these shops and you know you wouldn't want anyone to see you going in. But now yeah. it's, uh, it's too easy, isn't it? Now. Well, yeah, because of the YouTube thing. On your phone, yeah. And there's just multitudes of things like gambling and stuff. Like that. Yeah, so, so many things. Yeah, that you can do mm. without even like doing it going like anywhere. Now. Yeah. Mm. They're not in the lust of depravity, even like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man take advantage of or defraud his brother in any manner, in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things. So, yeah, and this is talking, he's talking to the body here. The Lord will avenge against one another between your brothers. If you are defrauding your brother, or if you are in the lust of depravity like the Gentiles, not possessing your own vessel, the Lord will avenge. Like he's not like a father says he punishes and chastises children who go in astray. If you don't get away with it because of grace, that's that's, that's false grace. Um, yeah, the Lord is a strict father and he'll certainly avenge the, those who do those things. He forgives um, you if you turn away from it, but he knows if you're still... Oh yeah, there's always forgiveness in repentance. Yeah. But... There's no forgiveness in carrying on. It's, you're going to get smacked down. Uh, the Lord is the avenger. and that's, At least that's a word that people know what that means these days because of the movies. The Lord is the avenger in all these things. As we have also forewarned you and testified. So he's like, I've warned you about this. I've told you. This is what happened. The Lord will avenge you. So for God has not called us to uncleanness, but to holiness. We are to be holy as he is holy. Be perfect as I am perfect, says the Lord. Therefore, he that despises does not despise man, but you are despising God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Very serious. It says anyone who loves, that's what the scripture says, anyone who loves the world or things of the world is a, and you've become an enemy of God. Really serious. As concerning brotherly love, you do not need me to write to you. So they, they, they've got that, they're doing well in that. Their, their love is good. They're being loving to one another, which is good. So, you don't need me to write to you about brotherly love. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do have love for all the brothers who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, that you increase more and more. So, we can always be more loving. You can see there, he's saying, he's done really well. You don't need me to write to you about love. You've been taught by God to do it. I know you're doing it. But we urge you, increase more and more in love. Be more loving. Learn to be calm and to conduct your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you so that you may walk honestly towards those who are outsiders and you may lack nothing. This is a common theme about working hard, conducting business honestly and working with your own hands. Um, in Thessalonians it comes up again. Yeah, yeah, working. I suppose it might be as opposed to um, uh, probably contrasting it because he talks about it later um, about those who won't work. Basically, that they they should be kicked out of the church. Basically, and they shouldn't eat. As well. Yeah, and they're not to eat. Basically, it's, I'm sure it's about that. Um, could be talking about servants, possibly people who just get other people to work for yeah, them instead. Maybe. Yeah, so 
that you may walk honestly towards those who are outsiders, that you may lack nothing. There's many proverbs as well when it says that you lack nothing. There's lots in the proverbs that say, um, if you don't do this, you will you will lack, you will no lack, um, and that you come under a curse, basically. People who, yeah, who are not work, who um, not talking about yourself, Andrew, because you're retired. So we do get to retire. No, we don't. Maybe. No. <laughs> It's, it's us lot, yeah. the young I, ones. God, I look, God, I'm looking forward to retiring, I can't wait. I know. We don't, we don't have to work until we die. God right. blesses people, um, if you work hard as well. Like, when I've kind of decided in my heart, I'm doing, if I've, like, I've had some terrible buses, um, really, really horrible buses, but I've just loved them and worked for them loyally and reverently and seen them late and kind of got the arm in my heart I've always just said I'm doing this for you Jesus I'm not doing it for them um, and because of that I've just had always had like emotional abortion abortion for a long time for a while it's like and it's come with testing because every single bus I've had in my professional career has been horrible like really horrible haven't I I've had well, like Nicola really, and I've had some terrible managers yeah Nick um, and thingy really cool but yeah, just got to work for the. Yeah, that's the thing. It's just always to be working for the, for the Lord. Yeah. You don't you don't really care about how they treat you if you're doing it for Him. It's helped me a lot. Like I've been, um, it's helped me a lot recently at work because I've had, um, because I've had so much work, like so many different things to do. It's been really stressful. So, if I was working for myself or if I was working for to please my company it would like destroy me because I can never never please it because there's always more work than I can ever do but I just work for God I just ask him what to do next and what do you want me to do today and until he's like that's it you've done your day's work basically and as long as I know he's pleased with me that I've done everything in my conscience that I should have done that day um, then I can have peace then because mm. otherwise I'd never have peace because there's always more to do never yeah, anything about work and, and I was doing that last year and I was working like 50 plus hours a week and working really late all the time yeah and I was just like getting burned out and, I, and there was always just more I was never going to get on top of it um, I never had any peace about it but from like really you've got a big post that reminded me about that as well yeah like, and work for God and it really helps with my time management as well. Like I've, I've always got, I might get in a in a couple of hours, I might get thirty things come into my inbox, mm. and it's like, and I'm not ever sure what to prioritize or what to work on. But I just pray. I just say, Father, what, what I'm working for you. What do you want me to do? And he'll, I just say, as it says in, in Proverbs, if we don't tr lean on our own understanding, trust the Lord, in all your ways acknowledge him and commit your ways to him, he will command your thoughts, it says in Proverbs uh, 16. And then when I do that, the thought just comes, like, yeah. he says, do this, that's, or do that, and then I, okay, and I just I just do that, and I work on that, and he, he helps me prioritise and know what to work on. And it's working really well. Since I've been doing that, I haven't been, like, stressed or burned out, and I haven't had any, he always leads me, because he knows what the most important things are going to be that people are going to, like, come back about. And I do it that way, and I haven't had any people saying, oh, this hasn't been done, or that hasn't been done. I'm always like, whereas before, I wasn't sure what to work on. So I could end up spending the whole day working on X, and the next day, people are like kicking off about the ones I didn't do, because I didn't know what's going to happen. Because he knows, he always leads me to like, you should do that, that, and that. And I'm like, what, really? I do it, and then, yeah. It's... I forgot that's what we used to do as well. Like, so with like our house stuff, and like thinking about what house to buy, like what should we do, or how, how should we do this room, Lord, or what should we do? We used to call on that scripture that says, commit all your ways to the Lord, and he will command your thoughts. Yeah. So you, you'll just suddenly get an idea on, actually, I think that would be a really good idea. Like the garden design and stuff like that, it was just, we committed it to God, and the idea just came into, and then, yeah, it always worked out. Mm. Love to do that. We just say, Lord, we don't know what to do. We'll do whatever you show us to do, basically. You, you know best. We don't know anything. We give it to you. And then it always works out. Mm -hmm. so it, works out it makes us realise how powerful our God is to be able to command your thoughts. Command our thoughts. Of course. Like, I couldn't command your thoughts, 
the Lord's coming. So this is a common theme to the Thessalonians, and you can see how. So like, when you see the order of the doctrine being unlaid, so James first establishes that there's it's the first epistle that there's more to faith than saying that you just believe in something right and he shows that he establishes that um, faith without works is dead and that real faith in Christ will always reflect in your life by you you'll actually do what the word says because you believe it then it goes into Galatians to that was the first letter written by Paul to establish the fact that we are not justified by doing good works right so you can't earn your way into heaven by doing good things and we're not justified by the, the the deeds of the law so nothing under the old testament of the jewish law that's like scrap that never saved anyway and it's done away with now but we are um the fruits of the spirit will come for those who are in faith and your life will reflect that from the fruits of the spirit under which there is no law we looked at last time love joy patience peace kindness faith humility all these things are the fruits of being in christ um, and it says those who um, walk in the flesh and produce the fruits of the flesh the ends of those things are death and created destruction but those who by the spirit put to put to death the works of the flesh and walk in the spirit will have eternal life we talked about in galatians so it's establishing those doctrines now uh, Thessalonians aim is to establish the doctrine about um, the resurrection from the dead and the day of the Lord and what happens to those who die and that they're in Christ and they get risen and all that so that's that's the, the main theme of Thessalonians is, is about um, the coming of the Antichrist <clears throat> the great tribulation the day of the Lord and the, the Harpazo the catching up of the ones who are alive on the earth to be with Christ in the air um, that's covered in Thessalonians 1 and 2, so it starts now. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. Brothers, and yeah, it's just important that, for a lot of people, this is like a side doctrine, or like quite a big thing, but this was established, this is Paul's second ever letter. So he would have been preaching this from here on. This is only his second letter, it's very early in the ministry, and he wants the believers to know about this this early on this is like a foundational important thing i don't want you to be ignorant brothers concerning those who are asleep so asleep is often used as a a metaphor for for physical death for christians because we're not truly dead when we go to you know our body goes to the grave yeah our spirit is a, our spirit is alive goes to be with jesus christ right if we have eternal life so that's why he says, asleep, because the wages of sin is death, and death is the punishment for unbelievers and for the wicked. So, because when they pass, they are dead truly. Whereas it uses a metaphor of asleep for, for Christians, because um, our bodies are just sleeping in the grave while our spirits are alive now. So, so, I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning those who are asleep, that you may not grieve like others who have no hope. So we're not meant to grieve. <clears throat> this was a, a real false teaching that caused some pain to someone that we know. I heard recently that they were told that when family members died that they weren't supposed to grieve like the world. Um, I was like, it's not what that scripture is saying. It's just saying, you, yeah, grieve. May not grieve like others who have no hope. That we're still going to grieve when someone that we love go dies because we're not going to see them again it's sad and we want to see them just don't grieve without hope like like the world because when their relatives die they're like despairing that they're never ever going to see them again we grieve that like when your, your dad passed away it's sad because you're going to miss him yeah yeah you're going to miss him but we have hope because we're going to see him again so it's like there's a, a positive thing for it you know we actually have hope so don't grieve like others who have no hope <clears throat> because if we believe that Jesus died and arose again, so God will br bring with him those who sleep in Jesus, <clears throat> which means those who die in the Lord. 
I shouldn't say die actually because it's not true. Those who um, really we should use sleep, but it can get confusing. But um, those who pass or pass on essentially, those who pass on because they're not dead. Um, but those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord <clears throat> that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who are asleep. So showing there that there will be believers, there will be Christians who are alive on the earth, awake um, when the Lord comes. We will not precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ. So see how he's talking. You can see he's used the word dead there. So to tell you that the one who's sleeping, he's talking about the people who sleep. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. That's where the word rapture comes from. Caught up means to be harpooned or snatched. Yeah, the original Greek there is harpazo. Yeah, it's harpazo, which means <coughs> like harpooned at once. Snatched. We who are alive and remain shall be snatched up together with them into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we're going to be taken up, snatched up into the air to meet Jesus in the air. <coughs> And so we shall forever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So this doctrine should be, when properly understood, should be a comfort for us. And that's what it, like, verse. I highlighted that because, um, like, this is highlighted from a long time ago, but because I used to not, I used to be really afraid of the rapture. I was really, really afraid. But then when you actually know what it is, when you have true teaching of rapture, you're not afraid of it. Yeah, something to look forward to. Yeah. It's an escaping of the wrath that is to come upon the world, so something for us to yeah look forward to. So, <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 5. And now this, this is a bit of a um, rebuke against, because we have to remember when, about the times and seasons, Paul in this is saying that, so when Jesus often said to he was talking a lot of the times to people who didn't believe in him, the great crowds, and often to the Pharisees, not his close inner circle. He's saying to them a lot, you won't know the time. You won't know the day. You won't know, right? You have no clue when the day Lord is going to come upon the world like a snare, right? Because you're not ready, you're not expecting. And now look what Paul says to now to us, to the children of God. Concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need that I write to you. For you know perfectly that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, right? But not upon us. When they say peace and safety, see, I was talking about them. He's not talking about you guys. He's saying, you know that perfectly the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brothers, you lot, are not in darkness that this day should overtake you as a thief. So he's saying it's going to come upon the world like a snare. It come upon the children of darkness very suddenly like a thief when they're not expecting it and they won't escape. But us, it's a we are not, it says, you know perfectly, right? You don't, concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need that I write to you, right? You, brothers, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the sons of light and the sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. I need to send this that to Jack about this sleeping thing because he's sleeping all day and awake all night. Therefore, let us not sleep as the others do, but let us be alert and sober. This is a common thing about being alert and sober. It's a very common thing that Jesus also uses in many parables like the... Um, the virgins and the servants, about those who are awake. He says often that, behold, I come at midnight, be sober, be awake, be ready and expecting. And those who are alert and sober and are ready and expecting, he says, will know when he's coming. They'll know the very, they'll see the times of the seasons. And when he knocks, they will immediately answer the door. 
because they're vigilant. We can only like um, we can only guess because it doesn't go into that much detail in the Bible. But like a little part of me wonders whether it will be like if it does happen during the night time here in the UK, whether we'll just all be asleep and then we'll just suddenly wake and we just know to like go to a window or go to we'll just know. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like there's a mystery about it. It's called the mystery of God, isn't it? I've been hearing audible knocking in the mornings three times now it's happened the first time I was like a little bit sleepy you woke I, literally, like this. I heard <laughs> it's literally like no no it's the bathroom door it's like a wooden door side of the bookcase <laughs> lower I woke up like Lord and I thought and I text some of my friends to make sure the rapture hadn't happened <laughs> right and I wasn't sure you said you I was looked confident. across and saw me asleep and yeah yeah like, okay, and I wasn't it. sure if it was a dream because I, I like I was sort of dozing it was like half past eight and I was like oh maybe it was just a dream like nothing happened and then a few weeks after that it happened again the exact same exact same tone time in it literally sounded like and it wasn't in my head it was it was in the room right and I was very confident that that second time and I was like what's that knocking again and like I woke Hannah up and she was asleep and I was like is anyone else and I text some people has anyone else been hearing either in a dream or audibly knocking right and then this morning my alarm went off right and now I know it was audible 100% because I was awake and I was texting my friend on WhatsApp. I'd, my alarm had gone off, right? It was 8.55 and I could see because that's the time on the messages. And I was right into my friend and it happened again. You but completely audible. I thought Hannah had snuck in, was in the bathroom ensuite door because it sounded like someone knocking on the bathroom door. And it was completely audible and I was wide awake as I am now. And I was like, and it was so spooky. I was like, but I wasn't scared because every time it's happened, the script has come to my head straight away is behold I stand at the door and knock from Revelation 3.20. Let me just quickly pull it up now. Um, I don't know what it means, but You've been doing a lot I've of been doing research about, about what it means. Um, You've been texting me all day. Revelation 3.20 says, behold I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him. <laughs> I'll bring him in to dine with me basically. Um, there you go. I will come in and dine with him and he with me. So I've been reading stuff about it and yeah, I won't go into this now, but it's a side thing. But anyway, this, I don't know, this feels like it's something to do with hearing and time. So it's happened a few times, but I, I swear it's been knocking. Check can it I, then. Just I, now I'm gonna like, yeah. be like get out of bed and say this guy was saying. I'll show. I'll send you this thing. It has. It has I'll send you a link about it. Well, it's no, but it, it feeds <laughs> well, on prophetically yeah, so, yeah. to what Andrew has been saying to you. So yeah, I know, I know. This yeah, guy that he's been reading about what this like other Christians that have heard knocking and stuff, and the research they've gone into the Bible and prayed about it and stuff, and essentially. Um, it can be a sign that the Lord is about to use you in a very mighty way. He wants to speak to you. And he's going to, to establish you. your ministry. And a lot of people who've had ministries and movements established have heard knocking, audible knocking. And a lot of the scriptures say, you know, knock and I want to come and establish this thing. So if you're hearing knocking, and at the same time Marcus is hearing knocking, that is very, very interesting. Yeah, seeing as you two are going out quite evangelizing quite together yeah. and you've been talking about you know, what do you believe? Yeah, but I swear it's not the bathroom like noise. Though. I think it's like establishing the Lord's Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, hit my That's, That's that exactly what a lot of these yeah. uh, ministers are saying. And mm. this one guy says that he actually, because he hears it quite a lot in his That's life, true. when he's about to do something ministri ministrally, and his wife sometimes hears it, and he actually physically gets up, opens And the he door, says, come, Lord, says, Lord come Jesus, Lord I Jesus. welcome you, Lord Jesus, come in. And, and, and he says, the if it's then. if it's not you, Jesus, then you okay. know I come on. You're not welcome. I tell you to get out of my house in the name of Jesus Christ, basically. But um, <laughs> it was at eight fifty five, and I read this thing, which I'll, I'll send to you later, and we can look at it at the end. 
and it says about the scriptures and prophetic and everything like look at what time it happens and it was 8 55 so i looked at in the bible for every time in the bible in chapter 8 verse 55 and there's only three times there's three times exactly with the three knocks that there is in chapter 8 and a verse 55 in the bible it only happens three times um and i look i got those scriptures up and they all relate to the same thing and they're Everyone all saying something really specifically to me <laughs> to me about god i'll get the scriptures after yeah oh andrew's had a vision this morning as well we'll talk about that later yeah i don't want to get I'll, I'll bring them up at the end because it is very very interesting but <laughs> I think we'll have yeah. time for the end of Thessalonians 1, babe. Hmm? Just check notes, because we might have time. Yeah, yeah. We started a bit late, so we'll quickly... Uh, right, so we're at the end of Thessalonians, anyway. Um, it's on Thessalonians 5 now. You're all the sons of light, and, not, and you are the sons of daytime. We are not of the night nor the darkness. Therefore, let us... Do not let us sleep like others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who are asleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love. You notice how these things are very often always together, faith and love. Not one without the other. And as a helmet, the hope of our salvation. Okay, so the breastplate, being faith and love, protect us, our hearts and our body from the enemy. The reason that the helmet, the hope of us of salvation is because that's knowledge, right? Understanding of the gospel, of how we're saved, the word of God, in our renewing our minds with the scriptures. That's what protects our, our minds from Satan. Yeah. So verse nine, very important. For God has not appointed us to wrath. That is why it has to be a pre or mid tribulation. It's the second time this is mentioned in this one. It is, yeah, yeah. Because God has not appointed us to the wrath of God which is the final three and a half years of tribulation as described in Revelation, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we should live together with him. So comfort yourselves together and edify one another just as you are doing. So he's saying, because, and this is all about, you know, the day. He's saying, don't be ignorant. Um, you know when the day will, is going to come. Be awake, be sober, be ready. Don't worry, God has not appointed us to wrath, so therefore comfort yourselves together and build one another up about this. This is should come, knowing this and understanding this should comfort you. So don't be scared off because the wrath of God is not for us. So final exhortations and greetings, um, and this is the end of First Thessalonians. And Second Thessalonians is very short, so we'll breeze through that. Um, we ask you, brothers, to acknowledge those who labour among you and are appointed over you in the Lord and instruct you. Esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace amongst yourselves. So these are the ones who are paying, them, paying the way for the other guys that are working in the brethren, in the, in the fellowship. Now we exhort you, brothers, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, support the weak and be patient towards everyone. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone but always seek to do good to one another and to all. So we should seek to do good to everybody. We should warn the, those who are unruly and be patient to all. Rejoice always. We should always be rejoicing. Pray without ceasing. Always be praying. And give thanks in everything. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Verse 19. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Many, many churches are guilty of that all the time, especially ones that say they don't believe in any of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, don't believe in visions, don't believe in prophecies, don't believe in tongues. How can they not quench the Holy Spirit? <laughs> yeah. um, do not despise prophecy. And that's why it says do not despise prophecies. So by saying that you don't believe in the gift of prophecy, that's basically despising prophecy, isn't it? I know uh, yeah, a professing brother in Christ who says he doesn't believe in any of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, doesn't believe in prophecy. He's definitely quenching the spirit and despising prophecy. But, so do not despise prophecies, but examine all things. So in other words, test the spirit. Don't believe everything. You have to examine it, discuss it, check it against scripture, see what it, you know, if it's true. Firmly hold on to what is good. There's another scripture that says cleave on to what is good, but hate that is evil and stay far away from it. Abstain from all appearances of evil. 
that's even things that might not even be evil, that you're not doing anything wrong, but even if it's something that looks like it could be wrong, or that your evil could be spoken, your good could be spoken evil of, or something that other people might think there's something fishy about it, abstain from that. Abstain from all appearances of evil. Don't even let other people see what you're doing that it looks like there's something going on. I think that's a lot hard. That's a lot easier to not do nowadays because there is so much more in the days of law and lot that evil is like the norm. I think back then, like a woman going out of the house after 8 pm was like, oh, what's she doing? Do you know what I mean? But nowadays, like, everyone's out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But there's still, there's still things where we've got to be wise oh, and, yeah. and think about how things look to others. Even if what we're doing is completely fine, other people viewing that, we've got to be, like a have wisdom about that. Living in the same house but not married. Yeah. Like, even if there's no relationship, leave people to see what it could be. Yeah. Well, for example, um, no, I, said, I don't want to give that example because it's like a bit sinister, but. Yeah, we just gotta think about how things look, even when our hearts even when our hearts intentions are pure, other people can see things happening and think, Oh, that's a bit you know, something wrong going on wrong there. Just just about being wise in it. Wise as serpents, but as harmless as doves. Yeah, there's definitely things about people that are just not nice Exactly, yeah. But less people are like because more people were likely to think that in the fifties than they are now. Yeah. Because it's almost the norm now. Mum and dad have their kids in their pajamas constantly, haven't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we are still seeing it in our people. Yeah. May the very God of peace sanctify you completely. We'll see what now sanctifying, being sanctified completely looks like. I pray to God that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless into the coming of our Lord Jesus. This is about being completely, wholly blameless and sanctified. This is the prayer, and this is what God, and look who is the one who does it. Faithful is he who calls you, who will also do it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So. By the coming of the Lord, or our, or our going to sleep, if we have the Holy Spirit, He is the one. He will sanctify us and preserve us, blameless. He will transform us and yeah, sanctify us completely. And that's what being born our again spirit, is, yeah. yeah. Being born anew. That your whole soul, sorry, your whole spirit. So there's three things here. You can see your spirit, your soul, and your body. Be sanctified completely, holy, blameless. Faithful is He who calls you. We will also do it so we can see that he is the one who calls us. Mm. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. That's a that's one for today, isn't it? We don't all do that, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what does that look like? Is that, <laughs> yeah. I like to think it's on the cheek, certainly, yeah. 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 Um, I don't think they're smoking each other. No, it's certainly a kiss on the cheek, yeah. But yeah. you know I don't think that'd be very holy. Yeah, so brothers should <laughs> greet brothers with a holy kiss. Um I don't think that is for, you know, you've got to think about customs because very common in Italy and France. I don't know about kissing the sisters if you're a brother, if it's not your wife. I don't know about that. I think that would be a cultural sort of interpretation. They do it in other countries, yeah. They do it in a lot of countries, but England is not really like done here. So that could be like an appearance of evil in England. People would be like, what are you kissing my wife for? No, so I'm not sure about that. But, you know, these things aren't like. This is the sort of thing where certain people that I know of would like make like a concrete doctrine around that and be like, every time you see a brother, you have to kiss them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And you and that you that you then get judged if you didn't do that. These things are like they're Passives, just they're not like yeah, them. like that. You know. <laughs> Yeah, but I don't, yeah, like, I don't, a sister. I think it, like, depends on, 
Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Like, I don't kiss my sister. I think it depends how close you are as well. Like, yeah. True fellowship, where you're who you really are, like, there's a big difference. I don't kiss my dad. I mean, or my mum. <laughs> so it's like, for me doing it, it'd just be like... But I kiss my stepdad on the cheek. Like, I'm 45. Yeah. Cheek, they go for a cheek. Yeah, because some do the double cheek. Remember, it's brother. Three all brothers with a kiss. I know, yeah. When you become brothers, maybe if you don't feel like you can kiss someone, you not close enough yet. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, but it's a common thing in that part of the world. They do that, so yeah, yeah, we're like quite reserved in the UK. We just go on holidays a bit somewhere where it's normal and then get used to it. Is that do they do that in in like African countries much like? A handshake. Yeah, they don't do England, they yeah. don't do like the Italian French style the on his cheeks and hugging and that as well. No. Even <laughs> even a hug is someone you're very really close to. Yeah. But nowadays they don't even really you don't even really kiss the person now. It's like say that's that person you should go like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's yeah, kind so. of like cheek smacking. Kiss into the air. The noise. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta be like Isla. If I said be like little children, I know. Yeah, Isla yeah. would go around and kiss every single one of you. That's very true. Yeah. And it does say you have to be like become like children. Yeah. All right. We better go quick through our yeah, next bit. So, brothers, pray for us. Mm-hmm. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I command you by the Lord that this letter be read to all the holy brothers. So, and that's the same. That's mentioned multiple times in different letters. This is why we're not meant to have just sermons where they pick and choose a few scriptures. The letters are to be read out loud in their entirety to the body, so that no, you know, no twisting of scripture, no um, out of context, and that you can see the full purpose of that letter that you've written with a the theme. Otherwise, people can pick choose and choose and make things up. I could, I could make my, the Bible will say whatever I want if I pick certain verses. Mm-hmm. It's interesting you say that because you kind of think of it with the, like a letter being quite personal. But it's to the body. Yeah. 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 All right. This one's very short. So this is only uh, three chapters, and they're very short chapters as well. But it's got one important thing in it, all about the um, the Antichrist and the coming of the man of sin. So it's the same three again: Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. The judgment at Christ's coming. We are bound to give thanks always for you, brothers, as it is fitting, because your faith is growing abundantly, praise God, and the love of every one of you abounds towards each other. Look, for he's praising them for it. So the Thessalonians have been pretty good. Yeah, yeah, lots been of love. Like, spot on. There's a bit of laziness that he talks about now. Uh, we boast about you in the churches of God for your patience and for your faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you are enduring. This is evidence that God's judgment, being righteous, will count you worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. So they are suffering for the kingdom of God, for the gospel. 90% of it will be from the Jews. It is a righteous matter with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what's, yeah, that's what's going to happen. The Lord's going to be revealed, sky ripped back, army of angels comes and take vengeance. So they shall be punished with eternal destruction. So you see how they're going to be eternally destroyed. Punished with eternal destruction, isolated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day, to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at by all those who believe. So remember we were talking about how he looks now in Revelation. People thinking about Jesus is like being this like meek and mild Jesus, but he's going to be marveled at. We're going to be amazed. We're going to be worshipping him. He's going to be glowing, eyes of fire, legs of brass, on a horse, clothed like the sun. We're going to be hair white. white hair, you know, coming with an army of angels. We're going to be, the whole world is going to glory and He's coming to be glorified in saints and to be marvelled at by all of us who believe. We're going to be worshipping him and be amazed. I think, like, a little part of me thinks, but maybe it's not true. <laughs> like, when I know more, like, 
but Angel's hair being white and the Lord's hair being white. And, like, as you get older, you're supposed to get wiser and wiser. And I think, like, the wiser you get, like, the more white hairs you get. And then when you become, like, fully wise, uh, <laughs> like, you're getting more and more white hairs. <laughs> Could be something, isn't it? Could be. No, that's quite wise, actually. It does, it does say in Proverbs that um, white hair is the glory to um, the grey, to the old man, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. The wisdom of the years. Can it's the crown of age. Yeah. Case, like, you just lose your colour because you get really wise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 You have what? <laughs> yeah, lots of it. <laughs> lots of what? <laughs> lots. Yeah. Of what? Grey. 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 Yeah. Like so when I'm asking like, if you're young and you grey as well. Like really wise when you're young, yeah. But if you have no hair, it's super wise as well. <laughs> I've been going like, yeah, no hair is like ultimate. Yeah. I've been getting like little white hairs and pulling them out, but maybe it's just going to start getting them wiser and wiser and wiser. Exactly. <laughs> right, so he, he is Jesus coming to be glorified and to be marveled at by all those who believe, because our testimony among you is believed. Therefore, we always pray for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. That's similar reflects in the words of Jesus when he says, pray always Luke. that you will be counted worthy to escape all these things, which is the wrath of God, as we know from this as well, and to stand before the Son of Man. So he's the same here. Paul is praying the same. We pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and with power fulfill you, fulfill all your good desires and your works done by faith. See how, again how faith which works through love and their good works being produced by the faith so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, chapter 2. The man of lawlessness. This is about the Antichrist. Now brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and concerning our gathering together unto him. This is where he raptures us up to be gathers us up to be with him in heaven into the mansions he's prepared for us we ask you do not let your mind be quickly shaken or troubled neither in spirit nor by word nor by a letter coming as though it is from us as if the day of christ is already here do not let anyone deceive you in that way and this is how he tells how we should know that the day hasn't come yet for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first I believe we're in the middle of the great falling away now. It's been happening. Sorry, the last so period. it's saying about uh, the day that it's talking about in question here. Is that the day of the Lord or the rapture? Um, I think it's talking. It says the gathering together. So it's the rapture. I think, yeah, the rapture oh, yeah, before. I think the day of the Lord is happening in the middle of it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, for that day will not come unless falling away comes first. Yeah, it is as well because the man is talking about the man of sin has to be revealed. So that's what happens. Gather, al paso, sorry, falling away, gathering up to be with the Lord, and then the re revelation of the man of sin then. In three and a half years he reigns, and then the day of the Lord at the end, which is yeah, when the destruction. Yeah, for that day will not come unless the man of sin is, like, you know, falling away. And the man, so the man falling away comes first, the and the man of sin is revealed. Before that day, then. Yeah, so we'll, could be talking we'll about the day of the Lord. the beast, essentially, but I've seen in the rapture. No, I think that's yeah, quite possibly. It's hard to tell with uh, that day. Um, I've got a big, a big study document on this, but with everything sort of lined up, so I have to double check. But um, the man of sin is revealed, who is the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself as God, and that is what Jesus refers to in Matthew twenty-four of the abomination of desolation, um, when the man of sin sits in the temple and says that he's God and makes everyone to worship him. Obviously, he's spoken about in Revelation as well, about the beast making everybody to worship him and set, goes to the temple and says he's God. Um, and in Daniel as well, talking about the same person. Um, it could be Peter. Because he calls him, so he says that he's a God. Could it be Peter? Yeah, but Simon Peter. Yeah. 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 Well, he's a bit old as well. He's, a bit older. he's not he very popular either. so far that has called himself a God, so that he is a God. Yeah. Sounds like shirtless and sallyings and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be similar. Do you know what it means by the temple of God? I guess I don't. 
Yeah, yeah, the temple will be rebuilt. Um, yeah, there, there's already plans for it in Jerusalem now. They've they've got a big yeah. um, they've got budget, they've got approval. There's a big project charity thing going on called the um, Temple Institute. They want to build the third and final temple in Jerusalem. Um, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Now, you know what restrains him, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already walking. Only he, notice with capital H, who's the Holy Spirit, only he who is now restraining him, another translation that says the restrainer, or he that letteth, the restrainer will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one, which is the beast, the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath out of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his presence. And that's what we can see that happens at the end of Revelation when the Lord comes back down. It says the sword comes out of his mouth and he throws Satan into the lake of fire and the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire with the word that comes out of his mouth. He will consume with the breath out of his mouth and he will destroy with the brightness of his presence, which is when he comes. Even him whose coming is in accordance with the working of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders. And that gets referred to in Revelation and by Jesus in Matthew about how when the beast comes, he'll do miraculous signs and wonders, so much to deceive the very elect if it were possible. Um, he'll come with all the power of Satan. So he will be a powerful man. He will do signs and false wonders. And with all deception of unrighteousness among those who perish. Jesus says it's such a great deception that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. But it's not possible for the elect to be deceived, but it's, it's saying that it would be very convincing. With all deception of unrighteousness among those who perish, because they did not receive the love for the truth that they might be that they might be saved. Therefore God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all might be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So basically saying that, I feel like the strong um, delusion is this like ultra grace movement because as you read that like I just thought about conversations I've had recently like with the gay yeah um they don't want to receive the love for the truth that they might be but because they because they have life. pleasure in unrighteousness they don't want to believe but the they'd truth they rather believe the ultra grace thing that they continue to live in unrighteousness and they're saved anyway it's so God it's saying strong. eventually that because they hate the truth and don't want to hear the truth God will harden their heart and let them be fully deceived so that they will go along with the false messiah, the false Christ. And I mean, it could be, that could be the strong delusion, this Christianity movement that is in the majority of the churches where you can still... Perverts the grace of God into immorality. Yeah, yeah. live a sexual moral life and it's fine. Live how you want, basically. Yeah, it could be... But it's a strong delusion then because they think they're Christians. They think they're saved. Yeah, deception of unrighteousness, because they did not receive the love for the truth. Therefore, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, so that they all might be condemned who did not believe the truth, but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. Interesting. It's all about lawlessness. This guy is the man of lawlessness, which means um, sin, basically, mm. not, not the way of God. We are bound to always give thanks to God for you, beloved brothers, because of the Lord, because God has from the beginning, oh, this is again another really strong election thing. Because God from the beginning has called you to salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief of the truth. To this, he called you by our gospel to obtain the glory of our Lord. So, yeah, from the very beginning, God has, as he said in the previous chapter, elected us, called us to salvation through being sanctified by the Spirit. That's how we get saved. We receive the Holy Spirit and get sanctified. And belief of the truth. We have to believe the gospel, which is how we receive the Spirit by faith. To this, he called you by our gospel to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what it was about. We were called by the gospel to obtain the glory of our Lord. Therefore, brothers, stand firm and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or by our letter. And he's talking there, um, the traditions which they've been taught, which was by Paul and Silas and Timothy about how to behave and what they taught them and how to act. Um, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and has given us eternal consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts 
and establish you in every good word and work. So God is the one who establishes us in all our good works and our good words. And then it's just, that's the end now. It's just very quick on, on three. Um, but with a very important piece of doctrine about working hard. So pray for us. This is chapter three. Pray for us. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may quickly spread and be glorified, even as it did for you. So that's a thing to pray for, that the word be quickly spread and glorified. Pray that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all men have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you, and he will guard you from the evil one. So that's very important. The Lord will establish us and guard us from Satan. So we have to have faith in him. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you, that you are doing and will do the things which we command you. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Now is the, the firm doctrine about, about idleness. Oh, so this is where they, they think good so far, this is where... Yeah, he did touch on this briefly before about, that's why he was saying, like, to follow the example we gave you when we, we were working and we worked day and night and we didn't charge anything to you because he's saying they've heard now from Timothy that there's people who are being lazy. Um, we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is a serious thing, <clears throat> Yeah, that you withdraw yourself, so that's similar to the wording to Corinthians where it's saying to disfellowship and not eat with or hang out. Withdraw yeah. yourselves from every brother who walks in idleness and not according to the tradition that you receive from us. So in other words, not according to the example that we set and what we told you to do, the way we acted. For you know how you should follow us. For we were not idle among you. Neither did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But we worked tirelessly and we toiled night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. <clears throat> so this is the example he's given of how Christians should work hard, pay their way. We did this, look, not because we did not have the right so they could have, you know, rightfully in God have received and charged charged the um, the church for their ministry because they were serving them and working for them in the ministry. Uh, we did this not because we didn't have the right to, but to make ourselves an example for you to follow. That is why they did this. They're working hard while full time preaching the gospel, working in the nights. <clears throat> for when we were with you, we commanded you. Remember that this is all commanded them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is very serious. That if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Yeah, it's very important. For we hear that there are some among you who live in idleness. They are mere busybodies, not working at all. We Now, concerning those who are such, who are doing these things, who aren't working, not paying their way, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that they work quietly and eat their own bread. But you, brothers, do not be weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey our word in this letter, note that man and do not socialise with him so that he may be ashamed. So we've got at the start of that, withdraw yourselves from every brother who's lazy and will not work and um, make a note of that man. Do not socialise with him. So it's the same in Corinthians. Don't eat, don't talk to them, don't hang out and withdraw yourself from them so that they may be ashamed. So um, still do not count him as an enemy but admonish him as a brother. Still loving. Yeah, still yeah. be loving, still be gentle, still be kind. We're to do that to everybody. But you've got to say, like, sorry. Um, and this is a challenge, like, you know, we've got someone who, you know, we know, who is funny because he's both both things. That the one in First Corinthians that I had to talk to him about was the same warning. And this one is a similar thing that it's very hard. Um, Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, it's difficult, and if he was here, it would be very sobering, um, but I'll, I'll have to send it to him. But yeah, um, yeah, don't socialise, withdraw yourself from ones who, who won't work, essentially, um, so that they he may be ashamed and will repent and will be restored back to fellowship. Um, now, may the Lord of peace himself 
give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, so he's still writing his own letters there at this point. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and this is the distinguishing mark in every letter. So I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 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 <clears throat> and that's the end of that. So I pause it all.